Hello? Yay! Morning, everyone. Welcome to New Life Alliance Church. Those that are here in the sanctuary and those that are viewing online. Let's all come together as one body under Christ and praise His holy name. Father, in this place, this day, we pray that you might invade this place by your Holy Spirit. Father, fill this sanctified and holy ground with your Holy Spirit. Father, cover us in the blood of your Son, Jesus. Wash us clean, Father. We come before you to honor you, to praise you, to glorify you. There is no God above you. We honor you. And Father, we would pray that you might forgive us for the times when we have gone astray, that you might... 
Forgive us for the times when we have been distracted. But Father, would you, in this place, this day, give us the reassurance of your love, of your amazing grace. For all that you have done for us, we praise you, we glorify you, we acknowledge you, we hold you King of all kings, Lord of all lords. Have your way among us in this place. Open our hearts and minds to receive that which you might have for us. In the name of your Son we pray. Amen. I'm looking for Judy Streets, but I don't see her in the house today. Do we have a picture of Miss Judy? No, oh, that's not Miss Judy. No. She's all the, it's in the bulletin, though? Oh, we got a picture of Miss Judy the in the bulletin. Ah, she's in your bulletins if you want to put a face to the name. Yes. She's supposed to be coming today. Uh, do, 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 you, do you think, Joe, that we should wait until like she gets here and then we can just like pull her up in front of everybody and pray yeah. with her? Is that, is that, <laughs> what do you think, congregation? Yeah. Her, we should just wait. Yeah. We should just wait. All right. In, in the meantime, we probably, is there any announcements that would like to be made? I know some people touched on some things that maybe uh, Miss Melinda wants to make a little announcement concerning. First, first care. Okay. That too. Uh, all announcements. Good morning. Okay. So on behalf of first care, Nancy uh, has been out of town for a little bit. And so on behalf of first care and Nancy and Tom Wheeler, who head up our, our ministry with first care, I got a letter this week from them. I just wanted to let you all know how we did with the baby bottle boomerang. So you all took your little baby bottles home. You filled them up with change and you brought them back and every penny counts. So to help save babies. So we just want to thank you in advance. So through Baby Bottle Boomerang, our church has donated $1,091.45 in cash, checks, and coin. So thank you, thank you on behalf of the babies. Next week, we are having a uh, potluck. Is it fifth Sunday? Yes. It's fifth Sunday. So we're going to do a little potluck. We are going to provide the hot dogs, I'm being told. And so we're asking you to bring a side dish, if you can bring a potato salad or an ensalada con piña or something of that nature. Um, and then if you can make a chili, that would be great. We could have chili dogs on the hot dogs. That would be awesome, too. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. It's always helpful if you can let us know what you can bring, um, a bag of chips or what have you. Um, it's always helpful. So if you can sign up on the sheet out there on the table, that would be great. And also tomorrow, uh, next Sunday, we're going to have an open house. We recognize that there's many people here who really have only seen maybe the sanctuary and maybe the foyer over there where we have our luncheons and other activities. So there's other areas of the church that maybe you've never seen. So what we're going to do is immediately after service, if you want to have like a little tour, you can come in and tour the office areas and go through the office areas to the, to the daycare school and where we have our children's church. There's an upstairs where the youth run around and do stuff up there, and we can do, you know. Anyway, we would love to share all that with you, so we're just going to have a time of, you know, you just kind of go through and see the facilities if you like, okay? And that'll be immediately after services next week. Anything I'm forgetting? The blood mobile. Blood mobile, thank you. Sorry. Next week, you know how this is very close to our hearts. My heart just has a testimony of that as well. Um, Blood Mobile is next week, and I just saw an advertisement, an advertisement on TV, but Lord knows I can't remember what the statistics were, but it really was terrible, the amount of people that give blood and the amount of people that need blood. So you all know there's a national blood shortage. If you can spare a little time, and Pastor Stan allows you, even if it's during service, if you can go and give blood, he really would love for you to give blood. If you can give, please take the time in a few moments and give some blood. That'll be next week as well. Big day next week. All right. Thank you so much. Anything else? Stone Castle Band will be leading service next week. Bar Worship doesn't service. have a voice. Stone Castle Rock Band is leading the service next week. You're not going to want to miss that. Anything Bring else? Bring people. It'll be a fun day. Bring people. They'll enjoy it. Is that it? Hey, do I get to do it this time? Woohoo! <laughs> Check this out! <coughs>
Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Is there joy in the house of the Lord this morning? Yes, Let's all rise and praise his name.
with the Lord and a thousand elsewhere in the world. We give you praise, Lord. Perfect love casts out fear. You, Lord, are perfect love working in us and showering down on us.
Give him praise. Give him praise. Jesus. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise that yet to come. There is one born of our salvation. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. The light. There is a light. Jesus.
Jesus Messiah. you Lord for you are God and there is no other you are the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end oh God all our hope is in you all that we have is in you we thank you for what you've done for us oh God we thank you for who you are oh Lord you are Jesus the name above every name that every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess every demon and disease must flee by the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. 
There is joy in this house, O oh God. There is joy in this house, for the joy of you, O oh Lord, is our strength, O oh God. You are amazing grace, O oh God. Your grace, your mercy abounds, O oh Lord. Nothing that we deserve, but you cover us with your righteousness, and we will be with you for all eternity, O oh God. We love you, and we praise you, and we worship you, O oh God. And I pray for the word to be brought forth today, O oh God. It will be that we will have ears to hear and hearts to understand and obey and be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word, O oh Lord. And we pray for Pastor Jeff, O oh God, that your word and your voice will come out of him with power and with unction of the Holy Spirit, O oh God. And bless us and instruct us this very day and beyond. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know those moments when you're, you're forgetting something? Yeah. You know, and then you remember last minute what you forgot? I forgot to assign one of you guys to read scripture. <clears throat> well, this is nice because then I can tell you a little bit about it. We got the Davidic covenant in here. Do you guys know what the Davidic covenant is? Did any of you guys uh, soap this week? Oh, busted. Busted. <laughs> David's covenant. You'll hear weird names, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant. All theological terms, I guess. But here, let's read scripture together. 2 Samuel 7, we're going through verses 1 through 17. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it. For the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. 
And I will provide a place for my people Israel. And will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. And have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's see if I can move this up. Maybe it'll stop that feedback. Well, my parents are off on a, on a road trip today. God bless them. And my mom keeps saying, we're going to listen to you. We're going to listen to you on the radio as we're going. So my goal today is to make this as boring and monotone as possible for them. <laughs> so that they can enjoy their trip. Right here, I'll start with this. A young lady attended a missionary service several years ago. And as she heard the missionary share the stories of danger and success, she knew that God was calling her to be a missionary. She prayed about it. She talked to several people about it. She just knew that God was calling her to be a missionary. She had no doubts in her mind. As she graduated from high school, she went to prepare to be a missionary at a Bible college. She then graduated and prepared to leave for the mission field. But just a few weeks before she was to leave to a foreign land to be a missionary, the lady's only sister and husband were tragically killed in a car accident. They left four children. Now the lady's parents had passed away and she had no other siblings. So the children were given to her to care for. Now there was no way, no way at all at this point for the lady to live out her calling to be a missionary. She shuddered at the thought of putting these four precious children in an orphanage. She took the four children as though they were her own. Now she was devastated by not being able to go to the mission field. For the next several years, she was a devoted mother to the children. She prayed for them every night. She raised them in a caring, loving home. And when the children were old enough to leave home, the lady was too old to begin a career as a missionary. How could God let her down like that, you may ask? Well, as it turned out, the lady's sister and husband had not been Christian. So the children were raised in a Christian home. And it also was the case that all four of the children that the lady raised went on to be missionaries. So rather than just the lady being a missionary, four missionaries came out of her home. Now God's purpose is not always what we see. And at times it results in a different outcome than what we had anticipated. So here in our scripture, we have the new king of Israel. We have King David. And he became king in about 1010 BC. And he reigned as king for about 40 years. And even though David died, God promised David that he would establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now this is that amazing promise of God to David, and it's known as the Davidic Covenant. 
the Davidic covenant. Now, it's likely that the events recorded in 2 Samuel 7 took place later on in David's reign as a king. In the beginning of verse 1 in chapter 8, it says, After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. Now, the writer of Samuel had a tendency to group things together thematically rather than chronologically. So we read in verse 1 of chapter 7, Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. It's a time of peace. The reason the writer of Samuel put this after chapter 6 is because chapter 6 is about David bringing the ark of God to Jerusalem. So now David's figuring out, where do we put this? It's still living in a tent. It's still with intense skin. Then David built a beautiful palace for himself. And we can almost picture David sitting in the cool of the evening on his porch, surveying Jerusalem and his palace and the, and the, the, the gladly palace attendants. And then the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now I, then the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. And this is the first time we're introduced to Nathan the prophet. And Nathan was to David what Samuel was to Saul. He was God's prophet speaking God's word to the king. And if you know your Old Testament, you remember that the ark of God represented the visible presence of God in the midst of his people. And it's an extremely important relic, an extremely important, I guess you can call it a piece of furniture that Saul had neglected for decades. But as soon as David became king, he wanted the ark of God placed in Jerusalem, which was to be the political and spiritual capital of the people of God. So Nathan affirmed the heart's desires of David, who wanted to build a permanent edifice to the house of the Ark of God, to house the Ark of God. Now he had a desire to build a house for the Ark of the Lord that was at least as beautiful as his own home. He shared his plan with the prophet Nathan, who was basically the chaplain for the palace, and Nathan thought that it was a great idea. But when he went to prayer that night, the Lord said to him, Hey, wait a minute. David will not build my temple. David was thwarted in his efforts to provide an, an adequate resting place for the Ark of the Lord. What's wrong with David wanting to build a house for the Ark of the Lord? Nothing, really. Even Nathan the prophet said, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Every God-loving man would have been in favor of putting the Ark of the Lord in a respectable place. And God had different plans, however. What can we learn from this experience of David? And why did God forbid this chain of events? I've mentioned this before, but have you ever heard the phrase, man plans and God laughs? I would say there's some truth to that, wouldn't you? And while it isn't wrong to have plans for ourselves, our families, or what else, whatever else we have plans for, one thing we should remember as Christians is that everything falls into God's plan. God is the great ordainer. He is the great mover of all things, the creator. And the lesson here really is that God is sovereign. David was a teenager when God promised that he would become king. David experienced many difficulties as he served Saul. And I believe Saul tried to kill David about 16 times. And that is apart from the times that David was in danger on the field of battle. And eventually, however, the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. To be sure, difficulties still lay ahead for David. Some of them were of his own making, but others were not. Nevertheless, in this time of respite, the Lord had fulfilled his promises to David. Now, David believed that God is sovereign. He clung to God so that he could sense the, the safe, sovereign heartbeat of God. 
Now we know from scripture that God ordains or decrees all things. From the most insignificant happenings, like the, the whereabouts of a sparrow, or the number of hairs on your scalp, to the ruling of empires. We see that in Proverbs 21.1. And even the outcome of dice, Proverbs 16.33. So who are we to object to the plans of God when we are yet powerless without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us? And again, it's not bad to have our own plans as we see here in Scripture today. David's desire to have a house created for the Ark of the Covenant was not wrong. It was forbidden, but not wrong. Next slide, please. God forbade David from building a temple. God had not had a temple at any point from the time he delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt until this time. And God was not saying that the idea of a temple was wrong. He was saying that the timing was not right. And in 1 Chronicles 22, uh, verse 8, when David is talking to his son Solomon about building the temple, David says to him, But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Now David was not allowed to build the temple, because he had shed so much blood. But God didn't totally disapprove, though. There were two things that he approved of. The first was, the next slide, the spirit in which the offer was made. David's heart was in the right place. His heart was in the right place. There was nothing wrong with the spirit in which the offer was made. God appreciated the motive of David's heart. Most of the time we see kings and leaders turn their back on God when they get to positions of power. They look at all the, the wonderful things that they have done and swell up with pride. And this happens way too many times in the Old Testament and arguably it happens now too. The pride of a nation getting to the almighty creator and mover of all things. Things including governments and people in power. That pride hindering the spiritual devotion of a land is all too common even now. But this was not the case with David. Perhaps David was out relaxing on his balcony, looking out at the wonders of his palace going, wow. Wow, it's hard for me to fathom what the, the Lord has brought me from. I was just a little guy shepherding a flock, and now the Lord has made me king of his chosen people. Yet I am in awe of all I have, but the Ark of the Covenant still lies in tent skin. The dwelling place of the Lord needs to be at the, the very least as ornate and elaborate as my dwelling place, as where I reside, and I must do something about it. I know I will build a great house for the Ark of the Lord to rest. To build a dwelling place for the Ark of the Covenant was a motive that was pure and noble. And David couldn't bear to see the Ark of, of God in a tent while he lived in a mansion. Now God looked at the motive of David's heart and took notice. Even though he would not allow David to fulfill that dream, he did bless David greatly. And the second thing that was approved was the object of David's desire. The other thing is that God didn't say that the temple was a bad idea. He only said that David wouldn't be the one to build it. And there are a couple of things worth noting regarding the temple. It's not where God lived. The fact that the ark of the Lord was in a tent meant that it was mobile. God's presence was with his people. It wasn't in a fixed location. Now that's instructive for us as well. God doesn't live in the, the church building. He lives in the people of the church. The temple of God is within his people. And our hearts are the temple of God. He dwells and lives within us. Not in a place made of wood or stone or brick. God wasn't saying though that the, the temple was a bad idea. A church building isn't a bad idea. But that cannot become the magic place where we go to meet with God. The temple was important to Israel for the sake of unity. 
for the sake of unity. And God said that David's offspring would build the temple. He was referring to Solomon. But I have a question here. What is our spirit and objective? What is our spirit and our objective? What is the object of our desires? When God denies us our desire, we must ask ourselves that question. What is our spirit and objective? David's spirit was pure. He was known as the man after God's own heart. His objective was noble. That isn't always the case with us, though. Sometimes we have selfish motives and objectives. While our objective to be a missionary may be great, the spirit in which that is decided may be entirely wrong. We may want, what, we may want that for selfish, egotistical uh, motives. But we must examine our motives carefully. Even if our motives and objectives are right, it still may not be within God's plan. In that case, like with David, it was forbidden with good reason. Next slide. There are four main reasons that God forbade David from building the temple at this time. One was God's presence was not confined to a location. The ark of the Lord had been in a tent since Moses put it there during the Exodus. The nation of Israel had been unsettled up to this point, And the ark of the Lord in a tent symbolized that situation. God's presence could be mobile. The presence of God could go with the people. A palatial temple was not necessary for the presence of God, though. And then there was the absence of divine direction. God didn't ask David to build the temple. He didn't ask David at all. It was a thought that occurred in David's mind. The Lord asked a rhetorical question in verse 7. In all the places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? See, God had it commanded that a house he be built for him. And the time still wasn't right. So it's important for us to wait for God's direction. Next, the time was not right. Israel had yet to fully settle the land. There were still wars going on with the neighbors. It wasn't the right time to put resources into building a temple for the Lord. The people were not yet safe from all the enemies that lived nearby. So we too must wait for God's timing in our lives. And perhaps something that seems like a good idea really might not be because the time isn't correct. The time isn't right. Now, if David had gone ahead and built the temple, it may have opened the doors, it may have opened the doors for attack from the enemy, for attacks by their enemies. With manpower diverted to building a temple, the defenses of the nation would have been let down. So the time wasn't right. And last but not least, David was the wrong man. He wasn't the right man for the job. Like was mentioned earlier, David was not the right man for the job. David had fought off the enemies of Israel, and his hands were bloody as a result. The Lord wanted someone who wasn't warlike to build his temple. The Lord wanted someone to build who was peaceful. Peaceful. And Solomon was just that man. By the time Solomon became king, the nation of Israel was at peace, and construction could begin. Solomon is given most of the credit for building the temple, but it was David who drew up the plans and gathered the material. See, now David did play a significant role in the temple building, but he did not actually get to build it. Perhaps we're not the right person for the job that we think we want to do. Perhaps we may play a role, but God has someone else in mind. The lady who was to be a missionary played a, a different role than she thought. She influenced four missionaries. She, her efforts were multiplied. She wasn't the right person. 
But those children were. They were the right people for the job. Next, it was forbidden in a gracious manner. Forbidden in grace. God was most gracious in the manner in which he forbade David from building the temple. So God showed David regard. He didn't just say, no. Like you're commanding a dog or something. No. God showed David regard. He let David know that he was held in high esteem. And twice in our passage, the word refers to David as my servant David. My servant, whenever you see that, God is pleased. God was pleased with David. God reminded David of what he had already done. The Lord reminded David that he had taken him from the pasture and following sheep. The Lord had been with him the entire time. David had defeated Goliath. David had conquered Jerusalem when no one thought that was possible. David had done great things. He had brought stability to the land of Israel after the tumultuous reign of King Saul. And God reminded David that stability was important. Stability was important. It is important. Verses 10 and 11 say, And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place. And be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more. As formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. God was reminding David that stability was necessary for someone to carry out his plan. God promised David an enduring dynasty. At the end of verse 11, the Lord said to David, Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Then in verse 16, the Lord said, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. David had desired to build a house for God, but God said he would build a house for David. The word house, this this passage has sort of wordplay on the word house. The word house doesn't mean the same thing in both cases. See, the house that David wanted to build was a physical structure. The house that God would build, though, would be a family. Now, you know how we speak of royalty. We refer to the family as a a house. The royal family in England is currently in the, the house of Windsor, right? The Windsor family is the royal family. And God is telling David that his royal family will last forever. And David's plan was also forbidden for a larger purpose. Forbidden for a larger purpose. God's purpose was larger than David could have imagined. Much larger than David could have ever imagined. David simply wanted to build a house for the Ark of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant. But God had a bigger purpose. God's purpose involves something much, much larger. And David's plan involved building a temple, which was a temporary structure. When Solomon did wind up building the temple, what happened to it? It was eventually destroyed. It was ruined. But God's plan involves something much more lasting than a stone structure. It involved the plan of salvation for the world. This is where we come to the Davidic covenant. Salvation for the world. Verse 12 says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now Solomon's kingdom didn't last forever. Even the line of David as as earthly kings ended. But if you look in Matthew chapter 1, the first words of the New Testament says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. The Messiah came through the descendants of David. Jesus is referred to, among other things, as the son of David. 
God's greater purpose in the plan for David's life involved the Savior of the world. The temple that Solomon built is long gone, but Jesus is still up on the throne. David's plan was good and noble, but God's plan was bigger and better. So this brings me to the Davidic covenant. What is the Davidic covenant? You note takers are going to love this. What is a covenant really? Well, a covenant is a solemn and binding agreement. This is a, de a definition I found. A solemn and binding agreement or contract made between two or more parties, typically involving promises, commitments, or obligations. In the context of religious and biblical literature, covenants often refer to agreements made between God and human beings or between groups of people. In the biblical context, covenants play a central role in understanding the relationship between God and humanity. They outline God's promises and expectations and are often used to communicate his redemptive plan for humanity. So God made covenants with individuals such as Noah that affected the entire earth. And God was so pleased with Noah that he said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. God blessed Noah and his sons and said only to them, only to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. And to your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I give you the green plants, I give you everything." But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Genesis 9, verses 7 through 17. So it was God who took the initiative to make a covenant with Noah. God's single promise to Noah was that there would never again be a rainstorm causing a flood that would cover the entire earth. And he signed his promise with what? Oh man, with what? A rainbow. God came up with that first, by the way. God also made a single covenant with Abraham where he promised the land and descendants to him and was commanded to keep the covenant. We see this in both Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, 99 years old, God said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. So that he would make a covenant with Abraham that would multiply him greatly. If you remember, he was, him and his wife were pretty old. Old enough to not have children. But God makes a covenant with him that says that he will multiply him greatly. Abraham fell on his face before God. Who then said to him that his covenant was with him alone. And that he would be the father of many offspring. And give him all the land he traveled including all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and that he would be their God. God also told Abraham that he and his offspring must keep his everlasting covenant by having every male be circumcised when they are eight days, and if they are not throughout the generations, they shall be cut off from his people because they broke the covenant. The obedience of Abraham was not a condition of the covenant, but rather his response inside a religious relationship. 
There could be no blessings and no fellowship without obedience. God also made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai after he reminded them of his divine acts and his call to obey him. Then God established Israel alone as a peculiar treasure, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and gave them stipulations, or what we call the law, that would guarantee the continuance of fellowship between them and he. The covenant was ratified by an animal sacrifice and the sprinkling of blood. We see that in Exodus 24. And God established a covenant with King David and promised him that his direct descendants would have an everlasting kingdom and be known as his sons. And among the covenants mentioned in the Bible, some are conditional, meaning that their fulfillment is dependent on certain actions or responses from the people involved, while others are unconditional, indicating that their fulfillment is based solely on God's promise without any specific requirements from the recipients. Next slide. Oh, there it is. The Mosaic Covenant. It's a conditional covenant. It's conditional upon the Israelites' obedience to the laws and commandments given through Moses. So, if they obeyed, they would experience blessings. But if they disobeyed, they would face curses and consequences. And if you read the New Testament, it's very cyclical. Very cyclical. They go through a season of obeying, and they're blessed. But then they'll fall away, and then they'll stop obeying. And then they, give, they either get taken over, or the curses fall upon their land, and then it comes back. So it's very cyclical in nature. And then we have the unconditional covenants. And these aren't all the covenants in the Bible, but these are some of the most important. The Noahic covenant. God promises never to destroy the earth with a flood again and sets the rainbow as a sign of his covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. God promises Abraham numerous descendants, the land of Canaan as an inheritance, and that through his offspring all nations will be blessed. The fulfillment of this covenant is solely based on God's faithfulness and promise. Then we have the Davidic covenant, the covenant made with King David that is unconditional. God promises him an everlasting dynasty, and one of his descendants will rule on the throne forever. The fulfillment of this covenant is not contingent on David or his descendants' actions, but it's rooted in God's faithfulness. And this is where I want to focus. This covenant is contingent on God's faithfulness alone. That he is going to build his temple. That he ultimately has a bigger plan for his people. And there is nothing you can do at this point to thwart it. For the Lord carries out all that he has set out to do. Since we understand God to be faithful, are we truly relying and trusting him in everything? Or are we continually pursuing our own will despite the friction it causes in our relationship with our God? Are we praising him for what we cannot see that he has protected us from? Are we trusting in his plans for the, the betterment of his people? Are we even willing to drop our, our worldly intentions for the intentions of building the kingdom of God here on earth? I think an important thing to do here is to look back at scripture. What does David do when he's told no? What does David do when his plan is thwarted? So let's continue in chapter, uh, chapter 7 here. And I'm going to read some more scripture. Then King David went and sat before the Lord and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. What more can 
David say to you? For you know your servant, sovereign Lord. Verse 21, for the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great are you, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people, whom you redeemed from Egypt." You have established your people Israel as your very own forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promised, so that your name will be great forever. Then people will say, the Lord Almighty is God over Israel. And the house of your servant David will be established in your sight. Lord Almighty, God of Israel, this is continuing in verse 27, you have revealed this to your servant saying, I will build a house for you. So your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Sovereign Lord, you are God. Your covenant is trustworthy and you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, sovereign Lord, have spoken, and with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. David has just heard God tell him the answer is no. The answer is no. God states in verse 10 that, I have a plan to establish a center of worship, but not now and not by you. You're not going to fulfill your dream. I'm going to honor you, though, because such a noble dream was in your heart, but is not part of my plan for your life. But we look here and see that David does not even question it. David does not question the, the veracity of Nathan's visionary words. Of Nathan's vision, he accepts them as coming from the Lord. He requires no further confirmation of God's will. What David does is that he goes and in humility sits in the presence of the Lord. Then in wonder asks, why would you allow me to be a part of this grand plan? Why? So this is a genuine sense of humility. David picked up on God's reminder that he had taken him from the sheepfold and raised the question many reflect, uh, reflective Christians raise. Who am I that you have brought me this far? Who am I that you have brought me this far? Sitting before the Lord, David's mind ran back to the beginning, to Samuel's visit to his father's house. He was overwhelmed at the memory of all the good things which God had done from that day on to bring him to the throne in Jerusalem and to bring peace and prosperity to Israel. Now one of our great temptations is to take for granted the blessings of God. It is good for our spiritual life to sit before God and just remember how far he has brought us. David softened God's forever in verse 16 to a distant future in verse 19. And yet this was insignificant in your eyes, O Lord God, for you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. And this is the way of man, O Lord God. So as David sits in God's presence, he sees himself as he really is. And the king recognizes his, his weakness, his insignificance. Thus, he is overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude for God's promise, for God's promises to him. And it was God's grace that had brought David this far from the sheep to the throne. And now God had spoken about his descendants far into the future. Now only as we realize our shortcomings can we be struck with awe and wonder that God would bless us as he has. 
David had lived through a period of great uncertainty, not sure whether he would ever be king over Israel. And now he has the promise, the one of his descendants that would be king. Now he has the promise that one of his descendants would be king forever and ever over God's people. In verse 20, David acknowledges he doesn't know what to say in response to God's promises. Again, what more can David say to you, he says, for you, Lord God, know your servant. So David's a poet and a songwriter, and he was a very verbal individual. But here he was tongue-tied. He was silenced by God's grace and kindness. But in his being still before the Lord, the realization of God's covenant promise is being processed and sinking in deeper and deeper. And able to be quiet no longer, praise begins to flow from David's heart in verse 21, where he says, For the sake of your word and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness to let your servant know. David is overwhelmed. He says, Lord, you've blessed my life and you've blessed my house. You've brought me from leading sheep to giving me this magnificent throne. Who am I? Who am I? It's important that every once in a while we sit down, take a long look at our short lives, and just count our many blessings. Who are we to have been protected from the rains that fell? Who are we to have been protected from the grounds that shook? Who are we to have been protected from the storms that ravaged, leaving households, hundreds homeless? Who are we that he has blessed our house and kept it safe? Warm in the winter, cool in the summer. Who am I, Lord, that you should give me health and strength to be able to hold a job or pursue this career or get this degree or to have parents who have encouraged me or to have kids and watch them grow? Who am I to be so blessed? And that's where I want to end today. Now there's some of us here who have lost so much that it's hard to hear. It's hard to hear sometimes when people say God is working things for the the good of his people. That his plans are greater than ours. Some of you, I can never fathom the pain that stems from what or who was lost in your lives. But I'm here to encourage you that God has built his temple in the hearts of his people where Jesus himself dwells. He has sent brothers and sisters into your lives to help you mourn, to help you heal, to pray with you, to spend time with you, to hopefully just listen to whatever is on your heart. And at least to me, that is a blessing beyond words. That is a blessing in and of itself, whether you not whether or not you believe what was ordained to happen was better than your plan. I commend you for being here today. And for those of you who have a hard time believing that there is a God out there who wants what's best for you, I encourage you to get together with a brother or sister in this room, maybe one of our elders after the service, and they can share with you their testimony and why they believe so. Then you have the freedom from there to decide whether or not you believe what has been said today is true. For the rest of you, I pray that the Lord continues to guide you and enlighten you to his will and purposes for your life. I pray that he guides the church for whom he is the head and continues to reveal to us his truth, his ways, And that we continue to usher in his kingdom here on earth. Preaching the word of God. Praising him with arms held high amidst the difficult circumstances. We continue to develop disciples. And guide others to the everlasting mercy and saving grace granted to us. In the unconditional new covenant that is the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. Rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Go, serve your God. Absolutely. 